Um, I'm Shah Osha, and I coordinate the series, and I'm going to introduce um, Greg Buck, who is a student in art work, and he is going to introduce today's speaker, Charles Mudede. So let's welcome Greg. Good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Buck. As uh, Shaw had said, I am in the Art Work Program. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce Charles Madede. He is currently the Associate Editor of The Stranger, Seattle's Independent Weekly, as well as a lecturer of English Humanities at Pacific Lutheran University. Um, I had a chance to ask Mr. Madede about his uh, education. He said to me he went to Fairhaven, which is um, an interdisciplinary school out of Western Washington University. And when asked about his, um, his degree, he said he kind of made it up. Uh, he has a BA as the art of letters. And as he put it, it's me reading a lot of books. So for all of us here at Evergreen, that's good to know you can get a job. Um, <laughs> on the masthead of The Stranger, he is listed as the editor of film. And as I looked through the archives, there were many hundreds of articles uh, with his writing credit. So as that is in the Stranger Archive. His range extends well beyond film into the arts, the culture, and the society of Seattle, the United States, and the world. Um, as we were talking on the way over, he is very interested right now in uh, the TV show Black Mirror. If you haven't checked it out, the episode to look at is uh, Man, Men Against Fire, uh, worth looking at. His longstanding column, Police Beat, he described in an interview as an excuse to write prose poetry. The raw police reports that he mined for language eventually provided inspiration for the 2004 fictional movie of the same name. The movie, Police Beat, was selected for competition at the Sundance Film Festival. The words of the City Coroner's report provided another creative catalyst for Mr. Mudede, with the 2007 documentary Zoo being the result. Also, an interesting thing, just watch the trailer, I promise you, it's intriguing. Uh, he was a member of the Seattle Research Group, a Marxist circle once active in the city. SRI provided critical content in the fashion of the Frankfurt School and published two books while it was active. Mr. Mudede's writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Village Voice, The LA Weekly, and Sea Theory. He himself has appeared in uh, roles in movies as well. Uh, please join me in welcoming, write, welcoming the writer, filmmaker, and artist, Charles Mudede. Hello, everybody. Um, OK, I just want to make sure everything is here. My cell phone's here. Um, thank you for coming this morning. I, I didn't expect uh, so many people. I, uh, I'm, I am a, I'm a real artist in the sense that I expect no turnout. <laughs> and I'm sort of like, that's my cred, is I expect two or three people. And, when, you know, and then when it's like, well, no one else is showing up, let's go to a bar and talk about this. And you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's me keeping it real. You know what I mean? But uh, I, um, so I'm here to talk about, you know, I sort of was sort of going into in and out what, I, what I'm doing right now and um, uh, what I'm working on at the present moment. And it's sort of, it's changed um, over the years. Um, uh, not changed in any kind of radical way, but um, I haven't really ever stopped reading, right? So it was mentioned that I, at the uh, at the uh, at Fairhaven College, I, I, I mean, and I also wanted to say this: I had a I had a British education in Zimbabwe, and um, it was very rigid, and point based, right? In the sense that, um, you know, you're an A1 or A2 or A3 or B1 or B2. So I mean, you knew, you know what I mean? It was really stiff and. Um, and when I came to the USA, the last thing I wanted to be was graded because I've been overgraded. I, uh, I I wanted a, a system where I could just um, enjoy reading, which is all I have ever wanted to do. And in fact, I always tell people the truth is, if someone could pay me just to read, and um, and to walk around the streets thinking about what I've read, I would love that job particularly. Um, <laughs> output is a problem. <laughs> You know, I really wish there was some kind of economy that just paid people to become better at what they were without output, <laughs> right? Without production. And, 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 you know, somebody could say, oh, look at him. He's just beaming down the street. That's worth something, at least. And I, but uh, I didn't, um, 
I'm not into, uh, I, I really, writing is very difficult and, and creating stuff is difficult. And also trying to communicate ideas with the public is very difficult. It's not easy. Also because language is not as, uh, is not as I mean, for me at least, it doesn't come out naturally. It doesn't spring out like, like, you know, like, a, like, a, like a, a duck on a pond. I mean, it's something I have to spend every piece of my body, every thought has to be focused on what I'm writing and sort of aware of the public. And that, 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 that's not an easy thing to do or to, to, um, uh, uh, to engage with, you know? And so what I've done is, um, um, is, is, is continue reading, you know, through the years and my ideas of sort of like, you have instincts and then um, you sort of read and then you find sort of what those instincts are telling you. So the books always sort of help you improve your instincts, right? You sort of come across a writer. For me, initially, it was, you know, I read Walter Benjamin, and I found that the way he approached the subject of writing about culture and art spoke to me, you know, in a strong way. And then as I went on, there was another guy called James Sneed, and I read his books, and he sort of like, you know, he, was in, he died in 1989 at a very young age, he was 36. And again, you know, his, the way he thought about race, particularly in the USA, he, uh, he blended uh, Roland Barthes uh, and the sort of uh, French semiotic school to consider images of black people in uh, the way they're represented in Hollywood. And he wrote this really early on, and I just loved, again, the way he sort of blended uh, thinking about his surroundings, uh, using fancy um, French uh, theoretical tools and the process and something like that. And then, you know, then that was another kind of reading and that consumed me for a long time. And then another reading, which you're sort of going to sort of see at this moment or hear me discuss, is really me reading a lot of a, an anthropologist who, who, um, who, who, got, my, uh, who got my attention um, about, uh, uh, about um, uh, about five years ago, and her name is Sarah Hardy, and it's Hardy with an with an H R D Y, no A. I think she has an, she's of uh, Hungarian extraction, and the the, the name is uh, is the way the spelling reflects that background, and uh, she's an interesting um, uh, uh, writer uh, and thinker and uh, researcher, and her book, her important book, is called um, Mothers and Others. And uh, that's her big work. That's her main work. She's done, a, she's done what she did to me, and which was interesting is when I was reading, I've always wanted to think about the human. I always wanted to think about art and our connection on a, on a more biological foundation. You know, I, I love the fact that we, you know, we, we, you know, it's great that we make music and it's great that we write poetry and it's great that uh, we write, you know, that uh, we make films and things like this. But I wanted to know what was, what was the biological foundation for these kinds of practices? This has been, you know, this is just, and I couldn't find it really in the literature of, of Marx uh, and I couldn't find it in the literature um, of even say something like, you know, um, Afro-American um, studies, and uh, and I couldn't find it. You know, it was always we always talked about culture as distinct. You know, human culture, not even human culture, it was just culture, right? And what I wanted to know is human culture, right? What what made humans make culture? And that was sort of the, the 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 thing that I couldn't I couldn't figure out, and a part of me drifted to uh, looked into what was then called social biology. And social biology was started in the 19, uh, mid 1970s, two big books. One is Richard Dawkins, um, 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 oh goodness, why do I not remember this book? It's a famous book. It's the one where he calls um, humans a robot <laughs> for their genes. Selfish genes, of course. I, I've, I've banished the word selfish from my mind. And, uh, and uh, that's why I did. I had to come back as a pauper, you know, and I didn't recognize it. Who are you? Anyway, it was like, I am selfish. And uh, I, uh, the, 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 the selfish genes by Richard Dawkins in the mid 70s came out. And, um, and the other one, and there, was, there were chapters in that that were clearly pointing in the direction of a sort of anthropology of, 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 of human behavior. And uh, the other one was, of course, uh, Edward Wilson and his book, 
which gave the name sociobiology. Later on, but there's a lot of controversy with sociobiology. Uh, people thought that if, uh, if, if humans were all determined by their genetic construction um, and so forth and so on, then basically there wasn't that much freedom. And then, you know, men were kind of like, okay, if men, like, if men behave like, like assholes or, you know what I mean? And it was because it was them trying to get women and all this stuff. And it turned into a nasty place. I mean, everybody was sort of justifying the most awful aspects of humankind through saying that, oh, well, what's important is that, uh, uh, you know, that breeding is what matters, not, not nothing else. I mean, if you make a copy of yourself, you've succeeded. If you make lots of copies of yourself, then you're doing even better than anybody else. And that's what life is about, right? And, and, and there's a lot of people who took that and it became evolutionary psychology. Anybody who's studied, um, who's looked into literature will know that there was this Darwinist moment not too long ago, about 2008, right, Darwinist criticism, where they would read um, something like, you know, the 19th century literature, you know, Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen, and just see, like, you know, nothing but people trying to position themselves to make copies of themselves, you know what I mean? Like, you know, who's, uh, I want that guy because that guy's gonna, you know what I mean? And, um, mass produce the thing, you know what I mean? I'll pump out kids or something, you know what I mean? And they'll be, they'll live longer. I mean, this is like, this is, this is a Darwinist approach and it was actually really, really popular. So when you, when you looked and then I was like, oh my God, this is a mess. The biological version that I'm looking for emphasizes people getting over, you know, um, sort of asocial behavior, right? People like profiting or, you know, pulling the wool over others, right? <laughs> you know, um, scheming and scamming, right? Just so that they can make copies of themselves, because what else is life but making more of yourself, you know? And it was just like, this is brutal. And how is this true? And, and yet, you know, if you read the literature and you, you saw it, they were convinced, utterly. I mean, seriously, you would think that if genes were like, um, invented, you know, whose genes were made by God, this God looked like Margaret Thatcher. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're just like, that's, that's who made human genes. I mean, it was like, there was no other way to just see this after reading Dawkins. You're convinced, yeah, Maggie was up there and she was like, I wanted to make sure that uh, humans behave like neoliberal, like freaks. You know what I mean? And with no, like, uh, with no in-betweens or no shadings, right? If you're not doing this, then you're obviously, you're wimpy or you're making things softer. You're not facing the hard facts, right? And so forth. And that was a, like, you know, yeah, this is liberals talking, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a story where, you know, Dawkins said, oh, you know, trees um, actually rise up from the ground competing. It's not a beauty thing or whatever. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's just them just trying to get more sunlight than the other tree and they don't give a damn about the other trees and you know what I mean and they, he actually said this I mean it was a, he, the word was no fellowship of trees right there's no socialism for trees and it's sort of bizarre and you read this and it's just like wow they've won over the discourse of social biology and evolutionary psychology so the whole notion of a biological picture of humans and their artistic practices is going to look kind of like funny right because why would you well, my, well I'm writing this poem because I want to get more babies you know what I mean is this like that's uh, you know what I mean I'm painting this picture because it'll attract the woman or a man or whatever and I'll get what I want you know but it's just like that's what they were saying to us and they didn't find it funny they were actually writing whole PhD thesis is on this. You know, it was published in Time magazine in this terms, right? I mean, by the way, I'm just going to make a little quick thing. I was fascinated with somebody who showed finally that trees do not compete against each other. And actually, you have mother trees that, uh, that share carbon with weaker trees, and they communicate through their root system. And that people discovered that when you rip trees apart and you, you leave them stranded, they're actually all lonely, right? And that they actually do need to have a network in the ground, and they use fungus to do this. this is not, this is somebody at the University of, uh, all you do today, Mother Tree, uh, University of British Columbia, and you'll see the whole picture. And uh, you'll, 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 you'll laugh, like, of course this is how life works, right? There's no corporations at the root of almost everything that's successful in life, and yet how we got to this picture of, of, of uh, this, you know, no fellowship for trees and so forth and so on. So this is what I, my, my thing was, like, how, how it was. So the person who saved me out of this quagmire was uh, Sarah Hardy. And Sarah Hardy um, is, takes a feminist approach to um, to uh, uh, to um, 
genetics to, you know, to um, human uh, sociality, particularly. And, you know, what she sort of emphasizes is that, is, is that, is that obviously we are, we are, we're, we're, we are an ape. And, and, but we are an ape that is really founded on certain things, and you will not understand humans unless you sort of look at these specific aspects of them. One of, one of the ones she sort of emphasizes is, is like, um, is, 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 a, is, is, is children take forever to raise, right? I mean, they're pretty useless for the most part. Right, I mean, I mean, you, if you really, I mean, I, people say, but no, if you look, I'm a, I'm a father, so I can say this, you know, um, you know, everybody, say, you know, because you have this thing where the neoliberals come in and they say they have this whole notion of human capital, and they'll say something like, oh, um, um, you know, um, when you're uh, when you're a family or in your parent, you're making an investment in your child, right? And so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm working and, and I'm putting all this money into my children because that's an investment, right? And it's just like, well, that's the most useless investment you could ever imagine. I mean, first of all, I mean, they might not even come back to me after all this investment, right? They could spur me completely, right? And, <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean? It's just like, there's no guarantee. I mean, you want to talk about it. Well, why don't I invest in a racehorse or something, right? You know, what I mean? well, rather than a child, a human child. I mean, if you want everybody, like, you know, it's just like, neoliberals don't make any sense because it's like, if you actually use their logic, you know, really, I should, you know, I should look at race dogs and racehorses and other kinds of animals that have real return capabilities, right? And certainties rather than human children. I mean, it's just like, that doesn't make any sense. So like, why am I, why do you use this language? And obviously it's not an investment. It's not an investment at all, right? When you then say you have to, you have to always be um, um, uh, uh, totally sort of like uh, uh, conscious of this, right? And so she sort of brings out the fact, and she sort of makes it clear that they know that children are, are, are really, are, something else is going on. So they're really useless for a very long time. Um, uh, they're, you know, they're, if you look at chimps and you look at other children in, in early ages, they're much more useful quickly, right? And get, you know, they get a better sense of the world. But somehow children um, demand much more care. And she sort of thinks that this is the foundation of our sociality. This is why, like, so for example, you know, a, a, a chimp female can go out and give birth to a baby and be done with it by herself. Doesn't need any help. Stay away. Don't come to my baby. Because he freaks out, right? Because he's worried that, that uh, there's competition and she, they may kill. So, actually, really, if you look at the care, if you look at the care, and this is her, this is what I always have to if you look at the care that a chimp mother gives to the child, it is like, you, it is the worst. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like nothing like it in humans, right? It is over mothering. Right, I mean, the, she's, she's always so too close, right? And always protecting, you know what I mean? The, the, the child never has a chance to see anything but the mother, right? And I mean, you'd almost think that these are the ones who turned out to be, if there was a human situation, they'd end up being kind of creepy, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, too close to mother for too long, right? And uh, that's, that's chimps. Those are chimps, right? Whereas we toss our children over to the relatives, you know what I mean? We leave the room, right? We go and do other things. We even leave them with complete strangers for whole days at a time, right? And they, they, so they have another, this, so we depend on others to help raising our children, right? And this dependency is not, is not, it should not be ignored, right? It should not be, it should not be uh, dismissed. This dependency structures the whole society. Right? So funny, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of talk, particularly in feminist circles, about the importance of dependency, right? But uh, because somehow we change and we lost, and we think, oh my god, look at him. Oh, he's dependent, right? Uh, you know, oh, she's dependent. Or, you know what I mean? They're, 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 they're dependency's got a bad rap in our culture, right? And yet, there's nothing, it's always like, it's the essential groove to making us a successful animal. Right? And because we can now, what happens is, according to her, is that we can now um, share the responsibilities of shared childhood. We can spend more time with others. We can do all these things that we couldn't because um, care and, and parenting, she calls it allo parenting, is distributed. And that, that's really a significant aspect of our kind of um, species, right? That's a significant aspect of the kind of ape we are. And now, if you, if I read, after reading all of, her book, all of her books, Sarah Hardy, I have the ground. I can move into a biological theory of art practices and all of these things that wasn't, like, Thatcherite, right? And, and, and much more, I think, consistent with reality, 
right? And so the question when, you know, when I was at this point was to look at several things. It sort of opened me up. I could like look at one the human animal. I could see them as comparing them with apes and comparing them with chimps. And, and not in a sort of negative way. I mean, a chimp is actually doing as evolved as a human being is, right? I don't see them, you know, like so, so the same thing. So uh, this, this has been the pro, so this formed the background now for the kind of thinking I'm doing, right? And, um, and uh, so the thing that I was going to talk about uh, right now is something that I'm interested in um, through two things. Um, I've become interested in housing. Deeply housing, and the first movement in housing for me, uh, and I write a lot about it, as is was a was a uh, 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 two things. One was an image, and I'll start with the image um, that caught me and arrested me. Always as a as a writer, there's always an image that just does not go away, right? It just it's just there, and it's just like you know everything melts away. You forget when you saw it or how you saw it, but the image sort of stays, right? And so I'm an insomniac. And I'm awesome, and I'm glad to be living in the age where there's YouTube. And uh, because uh, insomnia suddenly has something to do. And, um, and, and so, of course, I go, what do I love doing? I love watching shows about primates, because um, they're close to us, and I want to see what they're doing. And if I'm awake, why not watch a documentary on chimps fighting each other or something like that? And uh, I, I saw one of gorillas, mountain gorillas, in um, Rwanda, and they had a... They had a. Uh, um, uh, they're moving through the jungle and shaking the trees. You know, gorillas are are, uh, are vegetarians, and uh, they they when they when they move through the forest. I just love how they shake the 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 the, the, the plants and the trees and the leaves move about. It's kind of mysterious. Oh, why is it? Why are the trees moving like that? Oh, the gorillas are going at it, and they need all these leaves because they 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 you know they 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 the, the, uh, there's not many calories in leaves, right? So you got to eat. And if you're particularly if you're a silverback, you got to eat a ton of the stuff, right? And so you know you spend a lot of your day chewing, right? <laughs> And that's like that's another thing. I mean, people don't understand how important that is because humans only spend about three, uh, th th an hour or thirty minutes chewing. A gorilla does not have this luxury, right? They're there for six hours chewing stuff, and uh, that means you're not going to be making rockets anytime soon. And uh, <laughs> and you know, I mean, you got to look at it. You see, there's chips too. I mean, cooking is really there's a whole cooking theory, which I kind of agree, that, it, that it's also a path to buying, giving us more time to do things that are really useless, like looking at stars. And, uh, and uh, so you have this thing, I was watching gorillas shaking the trees on, on YouTube and uh, eating these leaves, and then suddenly it's in the middle of the day, and the climate of the region is such that uh, uh, a rainstorm hits every afternoon around, you know, around 12 or 1 just a downpour, right? And, um, and the camera team is there filming this troop, uh, I'm not sure if they're called troops, baboons or troops, anyway. Um, uh, they're watching this family, it's a family, yeah, with the silverback and, 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 uh, and two, and the mothers and the children, and they, they just, they just they, the rain starts and the thing that hits me happens. Um, they just sit there and they obviously don't like the rain. <laughs> you know, they're just getting wet. And they're, they're, just, they're just immobile. I mean, they're, they're immobilized by their whole being. You know, they've been doing this for thousands, maybe millions of years, and they have not found a solution as to what to do when it rains, right? You just take it. You just sit there and take it. And the whole family, you just look at their faces, and they're like, oh my god, no one here is happy. Every, every for one hour of the day, they have to be unhappy, right? They have to go through this horrible thing, right? Their fur gets soaky. There's nothing, I mean, there's just, they've made the leap. I mean, you, you know, you'd want to guide them and say, oh my God, maybe let me just show you how you get out of this situation, but they don't. No, they're just there. And I couldn't figure out, is this like the state of, is this true that they cannot resolve this problem? What to do when there's tons of rain on you? I mean, I, we laugh. And I think I, and I, that's one of the things I put this out. I mean, we laugh at this because we're humans. Of course we know. Goodness gracious, I'm not going to stick outside and take it. <laughs> right? I'm not going to take this stuff. I want to find a place of shelter. Right? And that, to me, offered me the thinking that I needed to consider 
the issue of housing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right? Because it's something that obviously we are not supposed to be on the streets taking it, right? If you look at the whole issue, it was really like, okay, now I can like think about why homelessness and all these other issues are so awful, right? You know, and okay, so you I go to my next thing. So so I, I'm thinking along these lines, like, you know, this is this is what is you know, we talk about rights as human beings, but I think rights are too legalistic. I want, I want a right be, to, to not get stuck in rain, right? The, the, you know what I mean? I want a right that's in the body, right? A right that comes out of the stomach, right? Not the head, a right, you know, because we have human, they say that housing is a human right. They're like, okay, fine, I hear that, I did that. But I, the, and then it becomes, it becomes like, but then also property ownership is a right. Right? And I was like, well, how much of a, how can you compare the right to have a home to the right to own property, right? Or the right to have, to have your millions protected by the government, you know? And I said, these are not the same kinds of rights, right? One is clearly socially manufactured or culturally manufactured, right? And the other one, though, comes out of the stomach, right? It's that I will not be that gorilla, right? I can not be left like that gorilla, stuck in the rain and having no options, right? I have, I'm a human being, I know what to do when the rain falls, right? I know where to go. And if you prevent me from doing that, then you are blocking me as a human being, right? So this is why I, I like to think of things like that. That is it. And so you, the other thing is, there was a, a story where, uh, which, which again, another story where someone had written who was homeless and had said that when they're out on the, in the streets, um, you don't think that uh, I have special abilities to hang out in the streets, right? So if anybody reads Foucault, right, there was this whole moment in madness and civilization, right, when he's talking about how the insane were thought to have uh, the ability to take the cold, right? Because they're kind of crazy, right? You put them out there in the snow and they can take it, right? They can hang out there because that, that's a sign of their insanity, right? And so people sort of like treat people on the streets in that way, like, oh, they can do it, right? They, can, they, have, the, they have some kind of uh, extra... You know, tough skin or something, right? Or you know, they're, they're in, 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 inured would be the word, right? To 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 the to the to the to the elements and also to um, to things like rats and whatever happens to you when you don't have the protection of a of a home. And actually, when I was reading this, she, the person was saying, "No, I still hate the sound of rats every night, right? I still hate that I." that they, they come to my tent, right? And I, and I love this, because I remember, because again, it reminds you, no, that person on the street is exactly you, right? That's how you would feel every night, how you would hate it. There's no extra layer of, um, you know, of uh, madness to protect them or something like this. No, no, they have to really do something that is unpleasant. So that's what I mean by the right as a body that comes out of the body, right? And so the next thing that I did was I, um, I, uh, I, 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 I was fascinated with, because I'm always working on art, I was fascinated with um, the television show The Good Times. Anybody watch The Good Times? It's back in the 70s. I saw this as a child. And uh, if anybody remember, remembers the story, uh, tw uh, 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 The Good Times is about set, set in a housing project. A family, a black American family, is uh, in Chicago, in the, uh, uh, in the Cabrini Green, nonetheless, housing project, right? They even have a room number, I looked for it, uh, in the real world, <laughs> and, uh, it didn't exist. But uh, the, um, the, 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 the Evans, as they said, the Evans family lived in this situation. And I was sort of fascinated with this, with this idea that a sitcom, right? A situation comedy would be built on the grounds that a family's trying to get out of the projects, <laughs> right? And every week they fail to do so. And this is funny, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like week after week, right? They, 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 something, you know, um, JJ, who's the, the artistic type, he kind of like, he kind of like paints his paintings and so on and so on. Maybe a, a guy comes and says, oh, I'll give you a chance at uh, having a gallery open. And of course, he ends up being a, a scammer and they lose money. Ah, oh, <laughs> That's the ghetto. And, uh, you know, and, and the next week, it was like, the, uh, you know, the Michael, the young kid, he was a smart, bright one. And he would like, you know, he good at, he's good at mathematics and all sorts of And so the family sort of banking on him to get out of the, out of the projects. And then uh, the other one is Thelma. She's beautiful, of course. It's a woman, so she has to use her looks 
to get out of the ghetto. You know, I mean, this, I mean, this is like, right, this is the 70s, and, you know, that's what they're, this is how they're sort of imagining. So marriage, genius, you know, artistic abilities, uh, hoping to, 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 to raise the level or the opportunities uh, of this family. And, but I was more fascinated also with, um, with the way that, uh, with the way that uh, with the way that the humor in the family in the humor in the uh, in the in the um, the humor in the comedy in that in, in the good times was also to me the reflection so if you for me my, my, I have imagination that does this if if the, if the laugh track right what is the laugh track in that show it's it's the laugh track is capturing a crisis right <laughs> so every time I hear the laughing. I hear cry. I hear like you know crying, right? Right? <laughs> because, because it's like you know it's not funny being uh, on the edge of your life every day, not knowing if you're going to be homeless or if you know what I mean. It's, it's really a big deal to be under the pressure, you know, the of, of your creditors, of, um, of of not knowing if your son's going to return home, of, of of living in conditions that are that are that have been neglected by the by the government since World War II, and and also. Also being left out of the prosperity, the middle class in the suburbs, of uh, the Keynesian, classic Keynesian prosperity, and having been left out of that, and here you are, you know, in a in a substandard modernist building, right, with all of which is which is done with as you know with as little um, effort towards expense, right, cutting expenses left, right, and center, elevators don't work, so forth and so on. I mean, here you are in this apartment, and you have a laugh track. <laughs> Right, for because it's a comedy, and I think I loved it because I said, "Oh, every time that you laugh, you should hear you should hear the noise of like something awful, <laughs> right? Like a grumbling, right, or something like that, right?" So this is what I was sort of sort of imagining, and I would then say, "Well, what's what are they? What what would uh, then the, where where this show sort of met with Hardy is um, is uh, is where I would say, well, this stress." This problem of being in a, a housing situation in the laugh track would be corresponding in the sense of with uh, Hardy in the sense that what I what I was trying to articulate and I still this is still under under this is actually under construction by the way this is uh, this is not this is where I'm sort of heading right now and um, would be to say that when you look at Hardy it would say that um, that that you're attacking you're attacking not just a, you're not you're not just saying you know. You're attacking a, the humanness, right? You're attacking a human right, right? And, and when, when a human right is deprived, right, you have to imagine, uh, not a human right in the legalistic sense, but a human right in the stomach sense. When that is deprived, you have to imagine an existential crisis of enormous proportions, right? Because, you know, you lose so much. Right, you the the, we, you know, the 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 crisis of the, the crisis of the of the person in that situation is terrific. They've lost something, where which would make them say be able to daydream. Right, they've lost something that would make them the fun animal they are that humans should be. They've lost all of these characteristics, and now all they do is worry, because when you don't know if you're going to end up on the streets, that's what that that worry is specific to your species. And so it's all the more heavier and all the more devastating, right? And so when people like go out in the streets and they see a lot of homeless people and they say, oh, it's mental illness, it's almost as if like mental illness got them onto the street. And I would almost guess by my instincts that quite the opposite happened, is that when your existential certainty, right, has been challenged significantly, your mental abilities are going to also be uh, weakened, if not completely, right, racked or racked or, you know what I mean? Shaken, profoundly shaken. And so mental illness is the production of the attitudes or the policies we have towards housing, not the other way around. So when you see people who are mentally ill on the streets, it's a consequence of going to the street, not a consequence of them not being able to cope. And finally, I'm gonna just end on this before I go into, the, into my thing. Finally, and this has been another aspect of my research, is that when we say, if we go back to my beloved Sarah Hardy and we think of, say, human beings as these super social animals, right? We know that mental illness is, or the, the, the stress, that's any kind of stress, has to be shared with other people, right? And if that is not, if, that, if there's no opportunity to 
So basically, no, nobody knows who or why anybody is good at anything, right? Until the end of the day, right? And so that's been a real gift for human beings. We don't know, we don't know what a baby is going to produce. We don't, when somebody, when Albert Einstein was born, they didn't say, ah, look, ha, a genius, right? They had to feed that stupidity for years, right? <laughs> For months, right? No, for, no for, every day. And it said nothing really interesting for much of that time. I mean, you, you know what I mean? It didn't have eyes that were like staring at uh, things meaningfully or something like that. You know what I mean? It was just like, no. It was, just, it was a regular, messy, awful, farting, bathing baby, right? <laughs> and, uh, and those people ha had to be there to support that creature. They would just not be there without this other these other interactions. So really, Albert Einstein and any other producer of great works is really the group in which that person, right, developed in. That's, that's who that person is. It's not a single person. It's, it's, it's the entire person who took all the crap, who did, who did all the work. And so, on. so when you look at that situation, you just don't end with babies, right? So my great example of this is that, so for a long time in the neoliberal world, and this, if you get, you'll get my sense here, in a long time in the neoliberal world, we become sort of like, oh no, we, we started like doing this sort of thing where we individualize employees, right? Where we, we look at performance as a specific thing, like, you know, how well are you doing? And computers have allowed us to really spe be specific as to like, what, are, what is your performance like, right? And so then they can measure it, and then they can say, ah, let that one go, because performance is poor, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. And it sounds, it sounds rational. You're looking for weaknesses in your company and, and in your production, um, uh, uh, in your factory and so forth and so on. So you're, you're, it looks like you're getting the best and you're getting with But the problem is that does not actually work out. The human animal does not really work that way, right? And so um, when you individualize workers in, that, in, in, that, in, in the system that we are in now, for example, nobody knows what anybody else is really doing, if they're doing badly or poorly. What, 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 what is lost is basically the, um, the camaraderie of, on the floor, right, on the work floor. Meaning that we know that at times people uh, that are close to us are not doing their best, right? And so it, a part of work and a part of our relationships is doing, is, you know what I mean? Is, is, is covering for other people, right? And that's not abnormal, that's actually quite normal when you look at it, right? That somebody may be going through a tough time or something and you have to cover for them, right? And there's no way in that sort of neoliberal rationality that it would catch you, catch those moments when you are doing that because essentially, right, you don't know when you're not gonna, you know, quite, quite true, you don't know when you're gonna need the coverage and so on and so on. So it's not, it's not when, when the neoliberal sort of picture or ideology is not addressing the way the human actually works. Right, it's failing the human, right? It may have results that are immediate, but it'll never produce under the circumstances of rooting out all the weaknesses. You'll never know, you'll never benefit or know or have the benefit of surprise. You'll never produce an Einstein or, um, or a John Coltrane under this situation. You'll never just, it'll just never happen, right? Because all you have is, uh, is uh, your notion of, of, of great performance, which is limited, right? And sure, I think that neoliberals would work well if they were dealing with like silverback gorillas, right? I mean, I think that that might have an appli applicability, but with humans, you've missed the point, right? It's not, their, it's not their strength that makes them strong, right? It's not their super performance. You've, you know, it's, in fact, it's how badly they perform that makes them great. Right, and it's, you have to sort of like you have to. It's counter in, in, intuitive. So basically, um, when you when you when you, you see that, and then we, um, uh, if, if you can connect that with the way that I'm looking at the way that we, that we deal with housing, and the way we deal with the uh, way we deal with like um, um, uh, um, humans on the streets and so and so on, you'll see that the system is actually depriving humans of uh, opportunities, essentially. If you look at it strictly, because not everybody, because if you start throwing a lot of people on the streets, you're throwing a lot of possibilities on the streets, right? Because we don't know. Because we don't know what something's great until it happens. There's no indicators. I mean, there are, you can take, you can use A's and B's and mine, you know, and, uh, and you know what I mean? And scores and so on. But in truth is we really don't know. And when you, when you discard a whole bunch of humanity on the basis that we have a competitive system, you're actually creating a, a mechanism that is, that is actually detrimental in the, 
in the long run for human beings because, um, because you end up giving them all this stress and then they lose their existential certainty, which you should have as a member of, uh, of society and so forth and so on. And, uh, and then you, you get them. So that's it. So that's, uh, the, 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 that's now I want to show you something really quickly. I'm not going to, that was actually supposed to be the introduction to the talk. <laughs> I think that that's, a, that's what I want to do now is to show something, and then um, um, and then to show something, and then and then we and then talk about it a little bit, and then we we turn it to the floor. Um, uh, um, uh, what I want to say is that um, when I began interest, my interest in housing uh, was was uh, uh, started around 2010, and um, I I made a work um, for um, a festival, the Manifesta. Uh, um, film, uh, no, no, uh, the Manifesto Art Festival. It moves uh, around Europe. It goes from place to place every uh, two years. And um, in 2010, I was invited to do an installation there. Um, um, and I call it the Twilight of the Good Times. And I just made a short film about uh, a short film that was shown on a television. It was, I sort of tried to reproduce the Evans Homes as a sculpture. And um, I wanted to show this because it, it, it really begins the journey, my journey into, um, uh, into, uh, into the housing question. And it also shows how, for me, the biological, the political, and the art are just cannot be separated, right? So the, the, the art is a kind of, for me, a, a, good, a good torchlight showing me like what, you know, it's so like, where, where do I want to go? And then I look for the political, then I look around and see what the, what, you know, and once all those are aligned for me, then I think I got the picture that I want. And then, but, but this, my first shot at it, my first dab at it was actually a short film uh, for this festival. And I'm going to show it now and then we can talk afterwards. And, um, and that's it. So let's just watch it. There we go. Oh. 